All right, guys, take your Bibles, your apps, whatever you read on, and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Uh, Luke is found in the New Testament, so go about two-thirds the way into your Bible. Uh, it's going to be with a bunch of American-sounding names, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You'll then get into Acts and Romans. If you're in a really weird-sounding name, like Malachi, you haven't gone far enough, so keep going. Um, if you have no idea where Luke is at and you don't want to try and venture the names, go to the table of contents. That's why God gave it to us, so use it. Um, but seriously, if you don't have a Bible, grab one of them out of the pew. Uh, if you don't have a Bible at home, grab that pew Bible now, put it in your lap, and take it home with you when we're done here. Uh, we want everybody to have a Bible in their home that they can read and study. And so consider that Calvary's Christmas present to you if you don't have a Bible. Now, this morning, we're going to be talking about worship, and so let me uh, open with a scenario for you. Let's say you're driving down the road in Lake Havasu City or wherever. It's mid-November, so before Thanksgiving, and you're listening to the radio, and a Christmas song comes on the radio, okay? You with me so far? Do you, A, crank that sucker up and sing at the top of your lungs and cry out of the joy that you're feeling because the Christmas music has begun? Do you, B, say, oh, Christmas music, that's nice, but it's two weeks too early. Christmas music's not until after Thanksgiving. Or do you, C, calmly pull your car over, get out, walk over to your trunk, grab your tire iron, and beat your radio until it stops playing the Christmas music? Um, don't we do that? Don't we all approach Christmas music differently? In my household, here's how it works. Jana loves Christmas music. She, she's a big fan, but she's kind of legalistic about it in that Christmas music is not allowed to be played in my home until all of the Thanksgiving leftovers have been nicely packed into their Tupperware containers and put into the refrigerator. So about 8 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day, that's when Christmas music is allowed in my home. But once that moment starts, the Christmas music is kind of continuous. It doesn't stop. So when we're decorating the tree, which in my home happens the day after Thanksgiving, again, kind of legalistic about that, um, but while we're decorating the tree, Christmas music is playing. When we go look at Christmas lights, we listen to Christmas music. When we're driving down the road heading to Walmart, we're listening to Christmas music. When we're in the kitchen cooking and doing dishes on an ordinary day, we're listening to Christmas music. And so that's the way my wife approaches Christmas music. I, on the other hand, could care less. Eh, it's nice to have it. If it didn't get played, it doesn't hurt my feelings either. And don't we approach music in general that way? I mean, think about the guys and girls that were on stage just now, that, that were up here before me playing music. Some of those people have literally revolved their entire life around music, their career, their, the mo way they've invested money. I mean, some of the equipment up here is worth more than my house. And so they invest and they spend a lot of time and they re revolve their career around music and music defines part of who they are as a person. Then you've got the middle category, and there's two people in that middle category. The first person is the person that can sing in the shower like a champ, and they enjoy music, and they like singing, and they, they get a lot out of it. Then there's the second category of the middle people who enjoy music, but they never do it publicly because they sound like a coyote caught in a bear trap. You with me? In other words, they would offend and or physically hurt anyone who was around them if they began singing out loud. That's me. Um, and then there's a final category that music, eh, oh well, they don't care. It, the music's just not a big deal to them. Um, and it's at this point that I have a confession to make to you. In a typical church service, a worship service or whatever that's Christian-focused, the music, for me, is my least favorite part. And I know some of you in this room just went, let's catch him outside and beat him up. <laughs> He's a heretic. <laughs> some of you are thinking, how dare you even say those words? But there's some of you in this room that also went, oh, thank goodness, I'm not the only one. 
if I don't connect with God through music the way you connect with God through, worship, through music, does that mean that I'm not worshiping God? No. Here's the catch, guys. Worship is different for every single one of us in this room. So here's the big question. What is worship? How would we define worship? Because I'm telling you as a pastor of Calvary Baptist Church that I don't connect through music the same way that I connect through reading my Bible and praying. Those are way more connecting for me than music is. So what is worship? Here's your definition. Worship is an outward expression of an inward obsession. If you don't hear anything or take away anything from this morning's service, this is the one statement I want you to walk away with. Worship is an outward expression of an inward obsession. And worship can be many things. It takes many forms. Since it's simply an outward expression of an inward obsession, that means that when I sit down and read my Bible, that's a form of worship for me. When we stand and we sing songs and we read the words on the screen and we enjoy that, that's worship. When we go and serve, that's worship. We took 50 some odd people up to Peach Springs yesterday to go love and serve, in the, serve the people uh, of the Indian Reservation up there. That was a form of worship for those people. When you tip your server at a restaurant and you do it not because of the service you got or the quality of service, but because you want to bless them in the name of Jesus, that's a form of worship. Worship is any type of outward expression that shows your love for Jesus, that shows that obsession that you have with him. You see, the way that I connect with Jesus is going to be different than the way you connect with Jesus. And the way that you connect with Jesus is going to be different than the person who's sitting down the pew from you how they connect to Jesus. And the way they connect is going to be different than your spouse or your friend or any random person who comes to church. It's very individualized. It's very unique per person because God wired us dramatically different from the people that were around. We are each uniquely made. We're uniquely wired to experience God in our own personal way. For me, it's not through music, it's through the word. You know, I could come to a church service and hear the sermon and nothing else, and I'd be fine with that because that's how I connect with God. Hear me, it's not how you connect and worship him, it's that you're doing it. That's what's important. You know, don't judge your spouse because they worship God differently than you do. As long as they're worshiping, that's their experience. That's their worship. Now, don't get me wrong. We're called to do all forms of worship. Just because I don't connect with God best through music doesn't mean that I don't sing or listen to music. It just means that that's one of the ways that's a little less of a connection than other things. We're all called to read our Bible and pray and sing and worship Him through music and serve and be generous. Those are all commands you're just going to connect through God differently through those different things. So, worship is an outward expression of an inward obsession. And some of you may be saying, you know, obsession's kind of a strong word. I don't know that I would use that for my relationship with Christ. Let me, let me say this. I would not say that I'm obsessed with anything outside of my relationship with Jesus. I'm a big fan of a lot of things. There are a lot of things that I spend time or, and or money or whatever on, and those are things that I am a big fan of. But there is no aspect of my life that dictates all the other aspects of my life the way Jesus does. I would even say that if you're playing the comparison game between my relationship with Jesus and the relationship with my wife, um, I would say I'm not even obsessed with my wife because while my wife and my marriage uh, dictate, she influences a lot of my life, Jesus dictates and influences infinitely more. My obsession belongs to Jesus. And so you're still going, well, I don't know that I would say I'm obsessed with Jesus. And so let me ask you this, why not? 
Why not be obsessed with Jesus? And let me give you the argument here. Why not be obsessed with the God who was in heaven and had a perfect existence, no pain, no suffering, not even discomfort, and on top of that, he was worshipped and adored 24-7, 365 days out of the year, 366 on leap years. And he left that perfect existence to come to this earth in human form and be hot and cold and uncomfortable and get his knee kicked and be injured and hurt and not like things and, and have to eat things that didn't taste good. He left perfection where none of that ever happened and came to this earth in human form so that he could live life, so that we could better identify and connect with him, so that he could teach us, and ultimately, so that he could die on a cross to save us from our sins. Why wouldn't we be obsessed with that God? Let me spin it in a different way. Why wouldn't you be obsessed with a person who took the death that you were about to receive And took it on himself instead of giving it to you. In other words, you're standing in front of an oncoming bus. And someone comes in and grabs you and sets you to the side and takes the bus for themselves. Why wouldn't you be obsessed with that person and what they did for you? Let me spin it one other way. You're sitting in a courtroom before a judge, guilty 100% of hundreds of thousands of millions of crimes. And the sentence is that you're going to live the rest of eternity in nothing but suffering and pain and death. And a man comes in and says, Hey, judge, the guy sitting there that's guilty, I'm going to take his place. So, buddy, get up. You're free to go. Experience eternity in heaven. And I will take your punishment instead of you taking it. Why would we not be obsessed with that person? With that God. He gave everything so that we could get what we didn't deserve, so that we would receive grace and mercy. Why would we not be obsessed with Him? Let me be clear the Bible is black and white on this. When Jesus, go to Matthew 22, when Jesus uh, is talking one day, a lawyer comes up, he says, What's the greatest commandment in all of God's word, Jesus? And Jesus looks at him and says, Love the Lord your God with all. All of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. In other words, Jesus says, love God with all of your being, with everything you are. That's obsession, right? If you go to 1 Corinthians 10, Paul argues that in everything we do, whether we eat or drink or go out or uh, whatever it is, we live life, we are called to do it to the glory of God. That's obsession, That's what I'm arguing here, that obsession is kind of an intimidating term, but as a follower of Christ, there's not another option. As a follower of Christ, we're called to be obsessed with the relationship with the God who ultimately saved us from what we deserve. That's why I'm obsessed with Jesus and why I encourage you to think about that. It's because of his love and sacrifice That love and sacrifice has created a passionate obsession in my heart and my life for him. So worship is an outward expression of an inward obsession. That's great and all, and I've given you some reasons to think about being obsessed with Jesus, but let me ask you this. What's the point of worship? I've given you a definition, but what's the point of it? Why do we do it? Luckily, the Bible talks about that. So take your Bibles and look at Luke 10 or Luke 2. Look at Luke 2. And let me give you a little background about what's going on. Mary and Joseph have left their hometown and they've gone to Bethlehem. Because Joseph has to be counted in the Roman uh, census and his hometown, the, the, the town of his ancestors, is Bethlehem. And so that's where he has to go to register. And so he packs things up and gets his very pregnant wife, Mary, and they head to Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem, what happens? She gives birth. 
She has a baby in Bethlehem, no place to stay, so she wraps him up in swaddling clothes and puts him in a manger. That's where we pick up in verse 8, because up to this point, all of the story, all of the account has been centered around Jesus and his family. Now, in verse 8, it shifts to a complete group of strangers. So let me tell you what's happening. Shepherds hanging out in this field. They've got their flocks of sheep out in the pasture buying and eating and doing whatever they're doing. The guys are probably sitting around a campfire just chit-chatting and hanging out and and relaxing from a a long day's work. Um, And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, an angel appears. Stop there for a second. I'm going to argue that most of us in this room have heard this story so many times that we've lost the awe and wonder about what happened in that moment. So let me throw a different scenario to you. Let's say you're sitting in your living room one day, friends, family, somebody's hanging out with you, you're watching TV, all of a sudden TV shuts off and bam, an angel appears in your room. What would you do? New set of shorts are the first line. That's what you do first. But would you be like, hey, buddy, you're in my way. Would you scoot over so I can see the TV? Or would you be in awe about the fact that an angel just appeared in your living room? You would be freaking out, I guarantee it. And can you imagine the shepherds sitting there in the middle of nowhere? These guys are nobodies. Shepherds weren't necessarily like lowly people, but they were definitely on the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. They didn't make a lot of money, and their job was dangerous. People in that day and time didn't go, you know what, I really want to grow up and be a shepherd. That's my dream. People didn't say that back then, because shepherding was not a glorious job. Didn't make much money. You were constantly putting yourself in danger. King David says in the Old Testament that when he was a kid and he was a shepherd, he had to kill lions and bears on his own because the lions and bears would come to kill his sheep. It wasn't a great job. And so these guys are sitting here and an angel appears and they're thinking, why us? Holy cow, who am I that an angel is standing in front of me Holy moly, or whatever the Jewish term in that day and time was. Oy vey. Um, and so they're, stand, they're sitting or standing there, and what does the angel do? Look at verse 10 with me. Verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not. I'll stop there for just a second. Fear not. In other words, the angel goes, okay, fellas, settle down. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I'm not here to kill you. (laughs) And then look at what he says. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all the peoples. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. So the angel appears, gives, this, gives them this announcement, this prophecy, and then what happens after that? As soon as he finishes speaking, a multitude, the Bible says a multitude of angels appear. Now a multitude in biblical terminology was anything more than several hundred. So there's hundreds or thousands of angels uh, before these shepherds in the field, and what do they start doing? They worship God. They stop and they take a moment to worship God. That's important because think about it. Up to this point, was it necessary? Because the angel gave his proclamation to the shepherds and he could have just disappeared and let the shepherds go on into Bethlehem. But that's not what happened. This multitude of angels appear and proclaim God's amazingness, God's awesomeness. Worship is important. And so the shepherds leave their flocks, which, guys, that was not a small thing. Shepherds in that day and time never left their flocks alone because something might come in or the sheep might wander off. That was a big no-no in the shepherding world is to leave your flocks. But they left their flocks after they picked their jaws off the ground, of course, and went to go see 
what the angel had told them about. And when they arrive at the place where they find baby Jesus, I mean, let's face it, there's probably only one baby in Bethlehem sitting in a manger in swaddling clothes. It's kind of a unique situation. And so they find him, and what do they do? They look at Mary and Joseph, and they're like, you won't believe what happened! And they start, you know, five or six or 20 guys start all at once telling Mary and Joseph what happened. This angel appeared, and you won't believe what he did, and he said this, and then all these other angels into one! Mary and Joseph are just absorbing it and taking it in. And then it says after they're done, the shepherds get up, they head back to work. But the Bible is very clear about saying that as they went back, they praised and glorified God. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine how the shepherds must have felt in that moment? The the excitement and the raw energy that they had after having experienced That one-on-one encounter with angels, amazing. They went home and praised God. So what does this passage teach us, though? It's a great account of of Jesus' birth, but what does it teach us? It teaches us first that worship leads us away from fear and toward joy. It leads us away from fear and toward joy. Now, think about it. What was the angel's first words to the shepherds when he appeared to them? Fear not. Don't be afraid. It's all right. Don't freak out on me. Don't be afraid. Fear not. And then he says, for I bring good news of great joy that will be for all the peoples. You see, Jesus does not want us to live in fear. That's not his desire for our life. Think about it. In a heart, in a person's heart, it's hard for fear to coexist with joy, isn't it? When you're fearful, is it easy to be joyful also? No. The two don't live together. They don't work together. They don't jive. They're water and oil. And so the idea here is that Christ, through worship, leads us away from fear and into joy. Let me tell you what happened this morning. This morning, I get up, think, Alarm goes off, and I think it's way too early. But I get up, because i got to preach to a bunch of you guys. So I get out of bed. I get cleaned up. I eat my breakfast. (coughs) I start drinking down coffee like it's going out of style. And I get in my truck, and I start heading here. And I get go through my roads, through my neighborhood, and I get on the highway. And I get on the highway and start heading this way, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm tired. And I look over into my passenger seat and go, (gasps) I forgot my iPad sitting on my countertop this ipad right here the one that has my notes i left it on my kitchen counter and i freak out and i get that sucker into the turning lane and i turn the car around and i start heading back home and in the midst of all that i get super frustrated and i get angry with myself how dumb are you to leave the one thing you could have left your phone you could have Come to church missing a shirt or a sock or a shoe, but this is the one thing that I need to bring, and that's what I forgot. And so I'm frustrated, and I'm angry with myself, and I thought, I'm about to preach to a bunch of people, and frustration and anger aren't exactly the best way to do that. I need to calm myself down. You know what? I'm going to turn on the radio, because I don't drive around with the radio on unless Knox is with me. You know, Knox loves to sing. I don't care. So (coughs) I turn on the radio, And it's on a Christian radio station, and guess what's playing? Christmas music. Yeah. I thought, okay, whatever. And so I start listening to the Christmas music. I start listening to the words, and I start lightly singing. Again, you don't want to hear me sing. It's not a pretty sight or pretty sound. Um, And so I start singing, and all of a sudden, all of those frustrations and all of that anxiety and all of that anger towards myself just kind of melted away. And it was replaced with a calm joy about what I was doing. I looked down at my clock. I've got plenty of time. I'm all right. I'm good. And guys, it wasn't the song. It was the fact that listening to the song caused me to worship. It was the worship. It was my focusing on Him through worship that changed the fear and anxiety and anger into joy. 
Worship has that effect in our lives. So it leads us away from fear and into joy. And secondly, worship focuses us on God. It focuses us on God. Think about this passage, this account in Luke chapter 2. <laughs> Think about all of the different people um, and angels involved. You got Mary and Joseph and Jesus. You got the shepherds. You got all the angels. What was the one common thread with all of these people and beings? They were all focused on God through worship, weren't they? Through recognizing who God is and how amazing he is. They focused on God. I would dare say that, now don't get me wrong, the Bible does not say this. But I'm going to speculate that those shepherds' lives were changed forever. Because of that worship experience where they focused on God in a new way. I'm going to venture to guess that their future was dramatically different as a result of this experience in Luke chapter 2. And we can live that same life. When we focus on God, our life changes a little bit. So for me, it's not so much music, but this Christmas season, I love to read the stories of Jesus' birth and what happened with them. One of my favorites is um, an account where uh, when Jesus was eight days old, they took him into the temple to have him presented before God. It was the custom back then. When a baby was eight days old, you took him to the temple. That's what you did. That was the Jewish rite. And so they took him to the temple, and when they get there, there's an elderly man. And this elderly man had been waiting his entire life to see the Messiah. And he had been praying, Lord, don't take me until I see the face of my Savior. And Mary and Joseph walk in with this baby, this unassuming infant. And when he lays eyes on Jesus, he says, God, I can go now because I've seen the face of my Savior. I love that story because it focuses me on God. It makes me think, that's so amazing. God, you're so um, awesome. You're so much bigger than, than what I can conceive Look at all the things when you sing, when you read, when you pray, when you go and serve, when you're generous in the name of the Lord. Those things focus you back on God. That's one of the beauties of worship. So worship is an outward expression of an inward obsession. And it leads us away from fear into joy while at the same time focusing us on God. I told you that I connect uniquely. You connect uniquely. So my encouragement is this. How do you connect? How do you worship God? What's that thing, that aspect of your faith that you would say, yeah, that's the thing that I connect and worship the most through? Is it reading? Is it serving? Is it singing? Is it whatever it is? We're called to do all those things, but there's going to be one or two or three of them that's going to be really key to the strength of your faith. And so what is that for you? How do you worship? How do you connect? How do you express your love for him? Here's the, my closing statement. I don't care how you do it. It's Christmas. This is the season when we celebrate the birth of our Savior. So however you do it, just do it. Worship God this Christmas. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you so much for this time, for this chance to worship, for this this place where we can come and we can study about you and we can learn about you and we can sing about you and we can serve you and we can uh, do all the things that you've called us to. But Lord, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us this morning and that you would show us how we worship you best so that we can have a closer connection, so that we can have a closer relationship with you. So Lord, I thank you so much for this time. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Guys, this morning, let's stand and let's worship the newborn Savior.